Our forum today is on stress and resilience, and my confession is that I am stressed. <laughs> I'm Father Costas. Um, I'm, I guess my, my actual job is director of St. Basil Academy, which celebrated its 70 years of operation. Saint, well, thank you. St. Basil Academy is a family. It's interesting because in a couple of hours, one of our young people is going to share her story with the ladies philopticos next door. It's a family because it's the church in operation. So what we do is we have a beautiful campus. Children come to us because their families are distressed, going through bad divorce, living in poverty, deceased, chemically addicted, ill. Some of them have a combination of all of the above. Perhaps a parent is incarcerated. Whatever it is, a priest will call me and say, Father Costa, we have a situation. We interview the child. If we know we can help the child, they come to us. They stay with us as long as necessary. What's that mean? If they're in third grade and the family, we work with the parent or guardian, isn't able to take the child back, they can stay with us through high school and beyond. So what happens if they're college bound, we help them get into college. So most of our children do go to college. The ones who have uh, academic issues go through educational programs in the lower school and we've got youngsters who, one's an electrician married in the church uh, at St. Basil, hoping to have a family married to a wonderful college graduate and doing very, very well. So that's what we do. But the children find a safe haven, very important. And when they come to us, you can see in their affect that it's like a stone. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. You look into a person and you can't see anything beyond dovlemma, that, that blank stare. And af after just literally a few days, it used to take us three to six months, after a few days and a couple of weeks, you see their whole body language changes. And they're just much more in tune to themselves and each other. For the first time, they've got structure. For the first time, they know they're going to eat every day, three times a day, with snacks in between. For the first time, they know someone's going to make sure they get up, get ready for school, and go to school. For the first time, they know someone's going to pick them up and bring them home and make sure they do their homework. And they might rebel against us, but you know what? They fall in line because we've been around so long that the other children are the coaches and they embrace the new ones, and it really works incredibly well. So if you know of any children that need St. Basil, let's, let me know and give us a call. Incredible work. We do church services Monday through Friday from 5.30 to 6. Sunday morning is Divine Liturgy at 9.30, and the children uh, the boys serve in the altar, the girls sing when they're moved to do so. Pre-adolescence is a tough age, but for the most part, they all know the services. And on Sunday mornings, we have a small community of people that come. What does that mean? We have some families that come. It's interesting because two of our families have autistic children, and we're embracing and caring and nurturing, and, and they're fine. They, we've They've, they're actually able to come up and receive communion now, and they do it very well. Interesting, isn't it? We have some older couples that show up. It's kind of neat, and I've always thought these older couples are, are really wonderful because the children of St. Basil see families that come to church. When we visit children, other churches for Vasilopita or whatever occasion, a couple of you have asked us to come and visit your parishes. They've seen families in church, and they know that they're not the oddballs that we, they go to church, that all Orthodox Christians go to church, we hope and pray. And these older couples are there, and I've always thought for these past 16 years, what wonderful role models that we've got the old timers, and they're in church, and they have been their entire lives. And I think wonderful, wonderful role models. I, I, I need our children to see that, yeah, you are an Orthodox Christian for life. So the holidays come, Pascha comes. We have Mother's Day. We give little things to the mothers. We have Father's Day. I, I give out things to the fathers, and I gave, found a pen and gave to the fathers, um, God loves you, and, and it went. So we had our normal crowd, uh, normal people are there. And then Monday after Father's Day, I got a call around 11.30 in the morning. And it was w the son of one of my parishioners. And he says, Father Costa, I don't know if you knew but my dad had been estranged from his children. I knew something was going on. He was an alcoholic, and he suffered with depression. 
married 51 years. I've known them for at least 20 years. Knew none of this. For me, they were a model pair, a couple. He says, I have to tell you that 8.07 last night, he parked his car, walked to the Bear Mountain Bridge, climbed over a fence, and jumped in. I'm still not right. I knew this couple for 20 years. We're a safe haven for children. We're a place where children will let go of the angst of their lives, and they thrive. And I had a couple that was right in front of me coming to church on a regular basis. If they had a trip to make, they would let us know we're going to not be here next Sunday. Started baking Prosforo two years ago. Had been retired, 84 years old. When I called the wife, she said, I, I, I kept the secret well. I said, that must have been daunting. She says, you don't know how hard it was. My colleagues at work never knew. No one never knew. Is it cultural? It's certainly not religious. Our church doesn't preach secret Shame, for me, it's the work of the evil one. But she struggled her entire life with this situation. She would go to visit her children by herself. They lived in other places. And I thought that was strange, but they're, you know, couples are couples. After 50 plus years of marriage, you think they need a break, a break from each other. How many of us have those situations? I remember when I first went to the Archdiocese in 1974, a year later, a youngster from New Rochelle had committed suicide. No matter, and I know this, I'm a logical person, I know that no matter what we do, no matter how welcoming we are and how safe and secure we try to make our communities and our families, things will happen. People are people and they're their own unique beings, and I know that, but gosh. All someone had to say is, can we talk? No, I'm a pretty open person. Um, uh, the children feel safe. Are they not children also? But not safe enough. They kept the secret, and it killed him. Perhaps something else could have changed. So, how do we minister? to the family, open embrace. I call two or three times a week. She's living with a daughter in another state, and she feels lighter. I can say that. I, I honestly can say that. She says it was a dark spot. It's, it is a dark spot. And I said, tremendous dark spot. And she says, oh, it really, it really is. I hope and pray that God, when he sees these opportunities or these situations, that he offers one of you and one of us the ability to listen, to embrace, to share, and to try and seek help. So what we have here is someone who's going to speak to the body and soul and the heart, someone who's going to speak to the community and what we have, someone who's going to offer suggestions as to where to go, and someone who's going to speak about parish life and what we can do. I'm very excited to be a part of this. I, I hope and pray that the Holy Spirit comes down and continues to work among us. Oh, and by the way, Christ is in our midst. I want to introduce Carrie Pappas, who will then introduce our first speaker. We are very excited about our panel of speakers this morning, they're each going to be bringing something different to the table in this conversation about stress and resilience in the family and hopefully begin to open up this discussion so that we can begin to be the dwelling place of Christ in our parishes and live in a dialogue of love with one another and minister to one another. Our first speaker is Dr. Trent Orfanos, who comes to us from St. Constantine and Helen Cathedral in Merrillville, Indiana. He lives in Crown Point, Indiana. 
He's been married for 36 years to Beth. They have four daughters and three grandchildren. Dr. Orofanos is board certified in internal medicine, cardiology, and integrative holistic medicine. He practices interventional cardiology at, at, in a private practice, and he, and he also teaches at the Indiana University School of Medicine. He is, has a strong conviction about the connection between spiritual and physical health, and that's what we're going to hear about right now. Thank you very much, Carrie, for that kind introduction. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. It says in Proverbs 23, 26. Let's talk about something that is very near and dear to all of us, our hearts. But first, if I told you that high cholesterol and smoking was bad for your health, I'm sure you'd all agree. But what if I told you that job-related stress was every bit as bad for you as smoking and high cholesterol? Would that give you pause? Here are some facts that are published in the scientific literature. At least 80% of office doctor visits are stress-related. Did you know that one-third of Americans live with extreme stress? and that nearly 50% of Americans say they lie awake at night regularly because of stress. Another recent article has confirmed that stress increases your risks for heart attacks, depression, and cancer. I'm going to talk to you about one aspect of dealing with stress, our hearts. So what is the heart? It's mechanical. It's also neurological. It's energetic. And it's biochemical. We often think of the heart as a mechanical pump, simply there to circulate the blood throughout the body. It's almost like a dumb terminal responding to signals from the rest of the body and not really doing much on its own. But the heart is the most powerful generator of constant rhythmic pattern information in the body. And that turns out to be very important. And I'll get back to that later, how important that is. It's also neurological. The heart has its own nervous system. It's been dubbed the heart brain. There's a whole scientific field surrounding this called neurocardiology. Signals are sent between the heart and the brain all the time. And in the parasympathetic part of the nervous system, that's one part of the nervous system, 80% of the signals that go between the heart and the brain go from the heart to the brain. Now let me repeat that. 80% of the signals coming from between the heart and the brain go from the heart to the brain. Now just think of that a minute. The heart is directing and instructing the brain as to what it is supposed to do. The heart's also energetic. It produces an electromagnetic field, and we can measure that field. The electrocardiogram, the EKG, that's the most well-known example of that phenomenon. The electrical field of the heart is very powerful. You know, we think about our brain waves as being able to be transmitted over distance, but in reality, that distance is perhaps inches. If you, if you were to measure it. But the electromagnetic field of the heart is 60 times, six zero times, <clears throat> more powerful than that of the brain. You can detect with sensitive equipment the electromagnetic field of the heart eight to 10 feet away from the body. Now, think of that also. Think of this invisible electromagnetic field that surrounds us 10 feet to our left, 10 feet to our right, 10 feet up, and 10 feet down. So around each and every one of us, there's this 10-foot electromagnetic bubble that's crossing paths with each one of us here in this room. 
when we're sitting at tables together. And information is being exchanged between us. Those fields don't just interact and you ever put a magnet together? You put the wrong ends of the magnet together, repulse each other. And the other end, they'll, they'll attract to each other. Electromagnetic fields affect each other. So have you ever been in, a, in, the, in the presence of somebody where you felt very anxious, very nervous, very uncomfortable, and you just wanted to get out of there as fast as possible? And that person may have not said a word to you. You know, some people may say, that's bad juju. I've got to get out of here, you know. On the other hand, have you ever been in the presence of someone who, without saying a word, you felt calm, safe, comfortable, nurtured, and you didn't want to leave. You wanted to just stay there in, that, in, in the presence of that, of that person. Someone might describe this as picking up the good vibes from that person. Well, this is part of that unseen information that is transmitted between us, sometimes unknowingly. Our hearts are also biochemical. They secrete certain chemicals. And they secrete chemicals that are called hormones. And the heart is part of the endocrine system also. Very complex organ. So the endocrine system is a system of glands in our body that secrete uh, chemicals that, that uh, uh, communicate with distant parts of our body, like our pancreas secretes insulin, and it makes our blood sugars go up and down everywhere. Well, the heart also secretes hormone. I'm going to tell you about one hormone. This hormone is called oxytocin. Some of you may have heard of it, especially mothers who've had babies, because this hormone is put in a bag and infused in, into moms who aren't progressing in labor. So it makes their uteruses contract so that they can deliver their baby if they're not doing it naturally. So as you might imagine, labor is painful and hard work, and they don't call it labor for nothing. But what happens to the mother after this painful suffering experience of going through labor? Now, it's very common if something gives you great pain, you are repulsed by what causes the pain, and you do everything to avoid it. This is a natural tendency. If something hurts you, you, you don't go back to the thing that's causing you suffering. But what happens to the mother after the child is delivered and the pain is gone? Well, she quickly forgets the anguish for her joy of the new child that is born into the world. And that's a quote from John 16, 21. She's flooded not with aversion, but with intense bonding and love for the new child. She falls deeply in love with her baby. That amazing thing, the amazing thing is that the hormone oxytocin Remember, she's flooded with this hormone at these times, at this particular time. The, the hormone oxytocin creates an in, intense feelings of bonding and love that seals that union between mother and child and overwhelms that natural tendency to avoid the thing that caused us pain. And the heart is second only to the brain in the production of this hormone of bonding and love called oxytocin. Now back to the question, what can we do about stress in our lives, especially job-related stress? Do we quit? Do we retire? Do we find another job? Do we move away? Ah, but there is a more excellent way. We can train our hearts to treat and even reverse the ill effects of stress. Now remember, earlier I said that the heart is mechanical and generates a powerful rhythmic force in the body. We can train the heart to beat in a more healthy rhythmic fashion. And this technique is called heart math. I can explain it a bit more during the question and answer period when I have more time. But when using this technique, scientists have found that by activating a positive emotion, this is important, a positive emotion, we can train the heart to beat in a more rhythmic fashion, and that creates body-wide health benefits. And the positive emotions that are among the most powerfully effective are gratitude, appreciation, and love. Now, this 
electromagnetic uh, rhythmic uh, activity of the heart can be measured with a small device that's the size of an iPod. I'm holding it up right now here in my hand. This measures something called heart rate variability. I know it's a technical term, but the idea is the heart rate varies from beat to beat. It's not perfectly regular. And that can be, you can train your heart to beat in a more healthy rhythmic fashion. And the healthier that rhythmic fashion is, the healthier your body is. It correlates directly with that. And there are many measurable benefits that have been studied. Depression improves, anxiety lessens, blood pressure falls, excessive weight is lost, blood sugars come down, cholesterol comes down, stress hormones go down, anti-stress hormones go up, including the love and bonding hormone oxytocin, which rises in this exercise but also executive function improves. What's executive function? That's the, our ability to handle complex tasks, to multitask, to run businesses, to run our homes, to do many things at once. Cognitive function improves, which means we're smarter. We do better on tests. We make better decisions. We make less mistakes. We have better insight and intuition, which surprisingly can be measured in scientific studies. And we even get better looking. No, I'm just seeing if you're listening. <laughs> and when heart math is used in the workplace, job-related stress measurably goes down. People are happier in their jobs. They do better work. They're more productive. They make less mistakes, and they stay in the jobs that they're in. Now, the message I want to leave you with is this. <clears throat> this marvelous biology with which we are divinely fashioned thrives on love and thanksgiving. God is the source of love, and God is love. And to God, all thanksgiving is due. So, we can actually say that the latest advances in scientific evidence concerning the heart and around the heart tell us that we are hardwired to know God. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Georgette Constantino. She comes to us from Akron, Ohio, she is the Administrative Director of the Division of Pediatric Psychology and Psychiatry at the Akron Children's Hospital. She is an active member of Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church in Akron, and her parish priest is sitting two people down from her. And this is a beautiful model for our churches. Georgette serves as a regular informal consultant to Father Jerry when he's dealing with pastoral issues that have to do with mental health. What a gift it would be for all of our parishes to have a faithful mental health pr practitioner in the community who is willing to partner with the priest and support him in his ministry. So Georgette, with no further words, please come forward and thank you. Good morning. There are four things that I'm going to try to do in a brief 10 minutes, so please pray for me. Um, first slide, please. So I want to set the stage, because I'm a child psychologist, with the seriousness of the problem of mental health for our children. This slide was put together under President George W. Bush's um, administration, and it shows you the prevalence of severe emotional disturbances in our children. Don't get too worried about the numbers, just look at the circles. Five to nine percent of our children have severe emotional problems which impair their ability to really grow and develop. Nine to thirteen percent going out are our children who have some substantial difficulties 
and 20%, and that's what I really want you to focus on, that is one in five children have a diagnosable mental health disorder. That translates into millions of children. The seriousness of the problem is that our own World Health Organization said that by the year 2020, childhood neuropsychiatric disorders will rise by over 50% internationally to become one of the five most common causes of morbidity, mortality, and disability among children. No other illness damaged so many children so seriously. So this is the context in which we live. And one of the things we need to ask ourselves is, what's going on? Are we better diagnosing children? Is there more mental illness? What is it that we have to face? I took a crack at looking at what some of the stressors are as I see them. I've been a pediatric psychologist for over 35 years. So one of the things I think that impacts us is the changes in family structure. One of those is the divorce. The other is dual careers. Families are struggling. There are competing, competing demands. Our children are so overscheduled that it's almost impossible to get two young children to play together spontaneously because everybody pulls out their iPhone to find out when might be the next time that two five-year-olds could just play. Uh, very sad comment. The, we have immediate access to electronic media, and that to me is a huge source for bullying, cyberbullying, all kinds of things are going on in a fingertip. That then exposes us to the world of drug and alcohol, to sexuality and the media, it takes no time at all for a child to get on a pornographic site by click, three clicks on the internet. We also have a culture of violence where violence is glorified and cruelty is glorified. Just look at the box office hits when you think of which movies are the ones where everybody can't wait to go. And then of course, the stress of competing, the stress of having to be the best athlete the best uh, college student, the best everything. Yesterday at Akron Children's Hospital, we met a state representative who lost her 18-year-old son to suicide and told us, she was, has four children, that she saw no signs that this boy would take his life. He was a high school senior at a private Catholic school, was on his way to college, and ended his life one day. And as she introduced herself, because she's now advocating for identification of kids with difficulties, she said to us, uh, it's been 225 weeks without him. I reworked, with the help of Presbyteria Carey, the theme of today, which is resilience. And this is a working definition of resilience that we think has um, a more orthodox uh, spiritual flavor than the definitions that I would find in textbooks. So let's look, take a really good look at it. We're asking people to be resilient. What does that mean? We believe it's our God-given inner capacity that when we nurture it, we facilitate it, and we support it by others. And that will be my theme, how we as a cl clergy community can help our children and our families. In the community of faith and by the grace of God, it empowers all members of the family and the family unit to successfully meet life's challenges with faith and hope. I was in Chicago over the weekend and went to the museum on Halstead Street to see the pictures of the immigrants, and if you get a chance to, to go to that museum, please do. And you saw these immigrant families who had so little, who came, many of our grandparents, with so little and were able to achieve so much for themselves and for their children. They certainly didn't have an easy road. What made it work for them? What are the components of resilience? There's some protective factors, and the first one is what we have, um, I say, like no other. The positive and powerful social connections that we bring in our communities. We want our children and our families to have competence and skills. We set high standards, but we give to others, and I'm going to talk about that again in terms of contribution. And because of our faith in God, we have optimism and hope. Every Pascha ends with the resurrection and gives us that spiritual renewal, um, which is just who we are and, and how we believe. 
a pediatrician, Dr. Kenneth Ginsberg, who actually works at CHOPS here in Philadelphia, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, put together a book called Building Resilience, and he had seven building blocks of resilient children, and they're up here for you. We're not going to, in 10 minutes, go through all of them, but I'm going to kind of sail through a couple and stay with contribution, giving our children the sense of competence, confidence, Confidence means that they feel good about their skills and their abilities. They're connected. They have a sense of character and morals. They are able to contribute. They're able to cope. And they feel that their lives are in some control. So I'm going to just take a few of these, because I think it's important for me to leave you with hope um, and not with despair. So Ginsburg says, and I think we could find this in a biblical passage as well, worded somewhat differently. What is the greatest gift we can give to our children? It's that we are role models for them of a balanced life. That we show them that when life gives us challenges, we take the steps needed to get back on track. That means, going back to your opening talk, asking for help when we need it. Not being ashamed to step up and say, I'm having a, a problem here. Could you guide me? Um, and I know Dr. Stavros will, will help us to talk about resources. We know that our children live up or down to the expectations that we set for them. The higher we set them, the higher they'll go, within their God-given limits. What do our children need? They need adults who believe in them unconditionally. Again, you talked about the mother-infant bond. Everyone in this room knows that we would give our lives for our children without an eye blink. That unconditional love, that same unconditional love that we received from Christ, that we have from God, that gives us the ability to be compassionate, generous, and creative. I've been at Akron Children's for 35 years now, and I can tell you that the children that we see don't have hope, don't see a future, don't see themselves as rich, and it's our job to help them get back to that richness. So we have to show them by our own actions, because as you know, our role modeling is more important than anything that we say. So we believe in ourselves, we believe in our children, we give them that unconditional faith. We also need to help them with the big C that is contribution. And this to me is probably the most important thing that I can tell you. I took care of a young girl once who was um, a dancer in a family of dancers. She had injured herself because she had overworked her legs and could no longer dance and didn't feel competent, didn't feel confident, didn't feel connected to her family, and she was shoplifting. I received her as a patient because she was stealing clothes from the local stores. And I said, I knew that she was in trouble with the courts, and I said, um, I don't want you raking leaves in, in some lawn as your way of doing penance for what you've done. She glared at me, and she said, well, what is it you want me to do? I said, I want you to give back. I want you to go to a, a nursing home, and I want you to go there every week, and I'm going to call your parole officer, and that's going to be your assignment. And she glared at me some more. And who do you think was the most successful and happy young girl? Because she connected, she was loved, the people in that nursing home were so eager to see a young, bright 16-year-old walk in that door, and she was able to start to feel good about herself again. So when we use the word contribution as we use it for resilience, we say that it is that ability that children have, that lesson that lets them know that the world is a better place because they are in it. That there are people who don't have the things that they have and that they can make a difference. Many of our youth ministries, many of the activities that we do in our churches are uniquely set up to tell our children how to contribute in, how to matter, how to make a difference in the lives of others. And when they do that, all the other building blocks fall into place because they know that they are here for a reason. They know that they are here, as I say, who is the best role model for them? It goes without saying that the very best role model for our children to follow isn't even their parents. It's 
Jesus Christ and the things that he did and showed to us. And so I believe that the Orthodox faith is uniquely positioned to give our children the resilience factors that they need in order to grow and thrive. I could obviously go on for hours, and I'm not going to because I don't want the Charlie Chaplin Kane to come out and pull me away, but I'm happy to tell you more of this as we spend time together in the Q&A. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. George Stavros, who may be known to many of you. He is a graduate of Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology back in the late 80s, early 90s, early 90s. And following seminary, he went on to Boston University to receive a PhD in pastoral psychology. He is now the executive director of the Danielson Institute at Boston University. They do some collaborative work with our seminary. George is an incredible resource in the Boston area for many people. His teaching and research interests are in psychotherapy, religion, and spirituality in clinical practice. He is an active member at St. Gregory Greek Orthodox Church in Mansfield, Massachusetts. And he and his wife, Thespina, are the parents of four daughters, so that's a family that needs to have some resilience. Thank you. When I was 12 years old, my father and I got on a plane from Chicago to Philadelphia. The Indiana Hoosiers were playing in the national championship here, the final four. We left without tickets, we left without a plan to get tickets, we just showed up on faith. We went to the arena, and somehow my father picked up on who the ticket director was for the university, and he watched him going back and forth giving people tickets. And then he approached him. He played the, my son and I have come all the way from Chicago card. <laughs> he pushed, but he was not pushy and we eventually got two tickets and we watched Indiana finish their undefeated season and defeat Michigan in that game. <laughs> Almost 40 years later, I'm back in Philadelphia and I want to share with you some thoughts from my experience as someone who's been responsible for the entry of patients into the mental health system. I've done this as a program and clinical director at Two Brattle Center in Cambridge and at the Danielson Institute at Boston University. And towards the end of the talk, I'm going to share something that I'm probably not supposed to share. It's something that clinical directors and program directors know about getting resources. And I'll ask you not to share that I told you when I do tell you. The reason I want to share it, though, is because I want you all to become expert seekers of resources for yourselves and for the parishes that you return to. So that will be the purpose. All right, so I would like to start with a scriptural image of a resource seeker. This is from the Gospel according to Mark. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. The healthcare system had failed her. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Two quick points I wanna draw from that. First, it's easy to get stuck. If we just look at public health statistics, they're very consistent with what Georgette just shared. In an average parish, let's say 300 persons, I don't know how large the parishes are that you come from, but let's say 300. 
in a given year, 78 of the 300 persons in that parish will suffer from a mild to moderate psychiatric episode, something uh, diagnosable, something on a clinical level. 78 of the 300. In a given year, another 17 will suffer from a major psychiatric episode. 17 of 300 in your parish. That could include a major depressive episode, a bipolar episode, a psychotic break, a suicide attempt or completed suicide. So those numbers are significant. We're talking about a good number of people in our parishes. Point one. Point two, while it's not easy to get unstuck, as Dr. Orfanos talked about, resilience is built into us. Dr. Kermit Crawford, a colleague of mine up in Boston, runs teams that go out to the most disaster-stricken places in the world in order to provide first response care to them. Dr. Crawford has sent his teams to Haiti after the earthquake there, to New Orleans after the hurricane, Katrina, and to Japan after the, the earthquake and tsunami there. And what he came back with were statistics that showed in each of these places there were dramatic spikes in mental health symptoms following those disasters. Dramatic spikes. He's got a great chart. I don't have it with me. But it's as if from baseline people shoot up to here. But that's not actually the surprising part of that slide. The, surpri the surprising part to me and the the part that resonates with Dr. Orfanos is that from there, given a culture of resilience, given relational support, most people come back down slowly. That's how we're built. It's built into us. And Dr. Crawford, being a man of faith, says his belief is that it is the way God made us. He made us to be resilient. Another image. This is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 8. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word, and my servant will be healed, for I also am a man under authority having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Two quick points from this. When it comes to mental health, psychotherapy helps. That's the, sh that's the short story. I know there are complicated stories that swirl all around that, but that's the short one, and it's the most important one. Martin Seligman from the University of Pennsylvania shepherded a large study done by one of the bastions of counsel and knowledge in our society, Consumer Reports. And in the Consumer Reports study, which was actually quite a robust study, they found three major findings. Treatment by a mental health professional usually worked, and most people who got treatment got a lot better. Active shoppers and active clients did a lot better in treatment than passive recipients of it. And three, respondents whose choice of therapist or duration of care was limited by their insurance company did worse. Second point from that pericope, some therapists are better at it than others, and it's worth the trouble to find the ones who are better. I can't imagine it was any mistake that the centurion sought out the Lord. He sought out the best because of what he wanted and needed for his servant. He pushed, but he wasn't pushy. So, as resource seekers returning to your parishes, what I want to leave you with is this idea of push, but don't be pushy. How do you do that? First, seek out the best clinicians and mental health institutions in your community. 
every community has high quality practitioners, but not all practitioners are high quality. Use word of mouth from people who have utilized their services, talk to other practitioners in the community, and gather up an all-star team of referrals. Put yourself in front of these people and ask them, can you see our people? Are you available to see our people? And some will say, yes, of course we are, and here's how to, here's how to do it. Others will say, no, we can't, we're full, there's a waiting list, I don't take your insurance. And you will hear that a lot. So push, but don't be pushy. And gather the resources that your community needs to address the kinds of examples that we've heard here. Push, but don't be pushy. That's the part that the program directors and the clinical directors sort of don't want you to know. We're suckers when people push and aren't pushy. We'll find a way. We'll find a way. So I want to finish with one last uh, gospel passage. This is again from the Gospel according to Mark, second chapter. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him, because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Emotional suffering is part of life. Good psychotherapy and psychotherapists can help. Make your parish community one that has access to the best because they're out there. You just need to push in the ways that those who saw the resources, the healing resources in the Lord pushed to get near him. For your breakout groups, we'll put up an icon, or a series of icons depicting these different gospel passages. I would ask that you share at your tables a story of your own victory in seeking out resources where you had to push, but don't be pushy. You can help one, at least one other person today if you do that and let others know practically how you made that happen, how you sought out, got resources in the healthcare community. Thank you. Our final presenter is Father Jerry Hall. He has had a long-standing ministry at the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church in Akron, Ohio. He has been there for 26 years. He sees his parish as a parish family. He understands the need for our parish families to help the families in the parish to build resilience. And he has built some, some beautiful ministries, family ministries in his community. He's been married to Helene for 35 years. As George has four sons, four, excuse me, four daughters, Father Jerry has four sons, a different kind of resilience in his family. <laughs> Prior to attending Hellenic, he was a pharmacy student at Ohio Northern University. He has done some further training as a priest at the Antiochian House of Studies and has a certificate of marriage and family pastoral counseling. And he actually was very instrumental in establishing an Orthodox marriage encounter back in 1990. And he and his wife, Helene, have held many marriage encounters over the years for Orthodox couples. Four sons, so I know a little bit about stress. <laughs> and it's hard to uh, follow a physician and two PhDs, so I don't really know exactly what I'm doing here on this panel, except that I think I've been gaining the uh, reputation for being willing to say personal things in front of large groups of people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I serve a great parish in Akron, Ohio. Uh, which I've been a part of for 35 years and have had 26 years serving as their priest. But I ask 
all of us to think about who we are, who makes up my parish, who makes up your parish. And the Lord really ex sort of explained that in his parable of the banquet when he says, we are the blind, we are the lame, the lepers, the sick, those in need of healing, those from the byways and the side streets, those are the people who are invited to this heavenly banquet. And that's who the Lord invites into his kingdom because all of us are broken and all of us need healing. And it's in that experience of the heavenly banquet of the kingdom that we are healed and ultimately that's what our salvation is all about. A healing, a restoration of our wholeness as human beings by our union with God. And although that healing takes place in its fullness in the heavenly experience, the kingdom of heaven we know is present with us in our parishes, in our churches. And so we are all in a process of healing. And for this reason, our church sees the parish and, and the church itself as a spiritual hospital. And often the fathers have, church, have called this Christian way of life, they call it the therapeutic path. But we have a problem with denial. And I would suggest to you that much of our stress that we experience as a result of our inability or unwillingness to accept our own brokenness. Is that difficult? Yes. Is it messy? It is. Is it uncomfortable? Many times. But is it absolutely essential? It really, it is our salvation. It is the path. It's our martyrdom. And it's the therapeutic way of an Orthodox Christian life. And really, simply, it's just dealing with the truth about our own broken condition. One of the things that I think is, uh, was outstanding about the Christians in the first centuries was the way that they cared for one another and for the strangers around them. And they did this because they saw so much more clearly their connection and their interconnection and communion with one another. St. Basil, we know, in the fourth century began hospitals, orphanages, institutions that take care of those who are elderly. The church was caring for those who were most vulnerable. And so we have to ask ourselves a very difficult question. Is there something extraordinary still about the way that we care for each other, about the way that we care for those who are in need of this therapeutic way? Or are we shocked to find out that the church as a hospital is filled with patients who are in need of healing. But if we understand and accept this role of the church and locally our parishes, then it is no surprise to us or uncomfortable reality, but rather a breath of fresh air where we can truly be ourselves. So don't get me wrong, this does not mean that we have a license in our brokenness to behave in a way that is destructive or hurtful to others. On that therapeutic path, we are seeking healing, receiving the spiritual medicines, meaning we're facing the effects of our brokenness and our passions by sharing them openly with our priests, with our spiritual fathers and mothers, and striving for a virtuous and holy way of life. But in that process, we must be the best champions that we can be for the success of our brothers and sisters in Christ next to us, not in competition with them, but knowing that in their healing and their health, we become whole and healthier as a body of Christ. Praying for them, encouraging them, opening our hearts to them, and accepting them in their brokenness as they accept us in our brokenness, and judging no one but being open to everyone, and I mean everyone, no matter how different they may be from us. I have a young woman who was visiting me in my office and she was lamenting about how her household was not the way that she wanted it to be. She had a list of projects that she wanted to get done so that her home could be this peaceful sanctuary. And as we talked and I helped her to realize that in truth, the stress that she feels from within her household has very little to do with her closets and her dining room, but it has everything to do 
with the interior of her heart and her spiritual mind. And that's the secret about stress, is that we create so much of it for ourselves. To be sure, there are many other stressors that are external to us. But the choice of how we encounter those stressors is always ours. And then to compound things, some of the things that we've talked about here on this panel already, is sometimes we tell ourselves that this problem or that problem, we can't take that to church. When in fact, that's exactly what we need to do. We don't go to the doctor and not tell him our symptoms. But somehow when it comes to the parish and the church, we believe that we can only show up when we have it all together. Or we pretend that we do. We have to be honest about ourselves and our struggle and our stress and our challenges in the church, in the parish, and with each other. And it's those qualities of integrity and authenticity about who we are and where we are going and how we're going about getting there in this environment of love and acceptance for one another that is infectious in the best sense of the word. You know, we go to our modern hospitals and we want to get out of there as quickly as possible because there's so many dangerous, resistant bugs that we can be exposed to. But in our spiritual hospital, we want to surround people with this spirit of love and honesty and integrity as they embrace this therapeutic way of life. Last November, I had the opportunity to address 150 of my brother clergy at the National Clergy Retreat. And I took that opportunity and spoke to them honestly and openly about some of the life challenges that I have faced in my ministry. I talked about my weaknesses, about my dark moments, about my feelings of being depleted. And I shared with them the effects of isolating myself in those times, and I shared with them the effect of finally reaching out to my brothers and sisters in Christ, taking hold once again of this therapeutic way, and beginning to face each challenge with its specific difficulties that it brought. But in doing that, I truly learned that in my weakness, Christ is strong. And I learned that because I risked allowing the church to know me and my brokenness. And in doing that, I came to know myself better, realizing my own pride, my own judgments, my own selfish ideologies. And yes, I'm still struggling with many of those things, but hopefully in a more honest and mature way, a little less afraid, and hopefully more authentically. Many people have faced more difficult trials than mine, who were, who were in the room at the retreat. But sharing openly about them gave them the opportunity to talk to each other about their struggles. And we all rediscovered that that kind of honesty and authenticity is empowering. Because as St. Paul said, in our weakness, Christ is strong. So I'm not going to talk so much today about the tools that the church has. We all know those tools that are at our disposal the healing sacraments of unction and confession, the divine fire of the Eucharist, the indispensable nature of daily prayer and spiritual direction. I'm here to encourage you and to engage in this therapeutic path to embrace this concept that our church and locally your parish is a spiritual hospital, a place of rest, a place of renewal, a place of restoration, and ultimately our salvation. And I'm here to remind you that there are literally millions of fellow pilgrims on this journey for whom we can pray, who can pray for us, and whom we can encourage and be those cheerleaders for those who share this journey alongside of us in our communities. To be open and authentic to the people of integrity and ultimately to be people of the love of Christ. So I'd like to leave you with a quote from Isaac of Syria who reminds us why this journey that is so precious is also one that is not easily taken, but has a priceless reward. And St. Isaac says, If God is slow to grant your request and you do not receive what you ask for promptly, do not be grieved, for you are not wiser than God. 
When this happens to you, it is either because your way of life does not accord with your request, or because the pathways of your heart are at odds with the intention of your prayer. Or it may be because your inner state is too childish by comparison with the magnitude of the thing you ask for. It is not appropriate that great things should fall easily into our hands. Otherwise, God's gift will be held in dishonor because the ease with which we obtain it. For anything that is obtained is also easily lost, whereas everything which is found with toil is preserved with care. Our church has preserved this therapeutic path to this great gift that is gained with hard work and God's grace. So let us embrace this path together within the church, our spiritual hospital, realizing that our goal is not to be discharged from the hospital, but it is transfiguration and glorification in the Lord's presence. Thank you all.